All right, greetings everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, my name is Hillary and I am the Director of Alumni Relations and I have the very, very fortunate and lucky opportunity to um, introduce you to someone who is quickly becoming someone who I look to as a mentor and advisor and therapist in many ways for this type of work. But she's also one of my um, faculty members in a program that I'm in. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Angela Patterson. And she is, wow, you have such an incredible presentation ahead. So um, everyone enjoy, please keep your chat open and uh, we can dialogue that way. This is being recorded and will be available on the conference website under sessions and then click on On Demand. And Angela, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, all. It's great to see you. Thanks for jumping on. Um, it's one o'clock here, so for whatever time it is, wherever you are, um, I'm so grateful that you chose to pop in. Today, we're going to about a little premise I have for you in terms of what DEI communications can look like. Um, I am a career communicator. And so um, I have a little theory that I'd like to present to you for your consideration. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can y'all see that okay? Yay, okay, great. Perfect. So um, before I jump in, I, it, I find it ironic that this is my day to present at a conference for DEI, knowing that I'm just a few hours drive away, um, Aldi, Texas, and I, I feel it. I feel remiss to not mention what's happening. Um, just in um, a spirit to say that. Obviously, the, the work that we do here, I like to think, is a way to um, contribute to turning the ship around, so to speak. Um, obviously, there's lots of factors that went into the events yesterday, and I don't claim to that anything that we're going to discuss today directly impacts that. However, I do like to think that as we talk about the tenets of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that perhaps we're setting the stage for our society to think differently about these things and hopefully to have some behavior change as a collective. And so I, I'm honored that we're doing this work today, hopefully in that spirit. Um, and so I wanna go ahead and jump in. So uh, as was noted, I'm Angela, uh, and I've been in the communications business for, almost 20 years. I started out as a journalist and I worked as a, a corporate communicator and a nonprofit communicator. Most currently, I am the director of communications at First United Methodist Church of Dallas. And so I dabble in the, in the religious and spiritual space. I am also a media psychologist, thanks to Fielding. Uh, I graduated in 20. 21. <laughs> it's, it's all a blur now. I was a COVID grad, um, but I particularly study how media and technology affect our religious and spiritual development. This is a, a fun departure that leans more on my organizational comms experience for this particular presentation. However, I do also teach in the School of Leadership Studies uh, in the ODNL Master's Program, and I facilitate um, what I can about organizational communication and organizational culture. So I have, a, I wear a lot of hats, I have gloves, and I love it that way. Um, as noted, I'm native Texan. I'm here in Dallas, a lover of Mexican food, a plant mom of two. They're thriving and it's probably not because of me. So that's a little bit about me. In this presentation, like I said, I wanna offer you a little, a little theory that I've created a framework of sorts about how we can approach DE&I communication. So first we're gonna just refresh on what DE&I is, look at what some of those best practices are today from a communication standpoint. Think about what is the ideal environment 
for diversity, equity, and inclusion to really happen within an organization. And then we're gonna talk through this philosophy and approach that I'm proposing to you as a way to approach organizational communication differently to embrace DEI more solidly, if you will. So that's kind of our roadmap for today. So unsurprisingly, what is DEI? Hopefully we're fairly rooted in this. Diversity, all of the ways that people are, are different from one another. Normally that is thought of, of gender, race, those sorts of things, but education, socioeconomic status, um, religious belief, there's a lot of things that, that make us diverse. With equity, that's all about ensuring fair and impartial access to all. The programs you create, the work that you do, all of the messaging around that should reflect a sense of providing equal opportunities. And then with inclusion, obviously we want people to feel included and have a sense of belonging. Um, so that just kind of recaps what I think we probably are already incredibly familiar with, especially by this point in this conference. But I do want to talk through some of the tenets of DEI because these will come back later in this presentation in various forms. And so I want us just to have a little grounding. Thankfully, Michelle Silverthorne, who is the founder and CEO of Inclusion Nation, which is a diversity consulting firm, she offers these 10 principles on how DEI takes shape in an organization. So these words are hers, not mine. I want to make that very clear, but excellent. Um, kind of recapitulation of what the tenets are. So uh, real quickly want to rattle through these. And these are phrased as if we're talking about a specific organization that we're in. So it might sound kind of weird, but this is, this is her phrasing. So with bias, we acknowledge the individual and institutional bias that have excluded members of an organization, regardless of intention. That's what we say that's when we mean bias. With centering, we know that an organization includes everyone, but we also commit to center the work around the pain and marginalization that some members of this organization have felt and not relying solely on the comfort of the majority. With, trans with transparency, we commit to communicating openly. With accountability, we hold ourselves and each other responsible. With specificity, we recognize that our policies and procedures have had different negative effects on marginalized communities. And so we commit to being specific on which policies will be assisting which groups and how. With measurability, we wanna set out actionable goals and actually measure the progress towards those goals. Realistic, we understand that this work will take time and we're realistic about how exactly that might come together and that the road might be a little bumpier than we anticipate. Uh, with the values, we understand our values as an organization and we commit to centering those around equity. With acceptance, um, we know that how we're going to show up in the future is different than we show up today and we recognize it's a journey. And then empathy, which is fundamental to what we're going to talk about today, we're going to listen to the stories of those who have been marginalized and we're not going to deny their lived experience. So when we think about DEI, that is kind of an ideal set up in terms of what we'd like to see in an organization. So what does that mean really for communications? Well, thankfully the Communications Network, another excellent organization has outlined um, a ton of uh, DEI communications best practices from thought leadership to how you should show up digitally, all of these things. I have a, a good reference list at the end of this deck. So you can, if you want to dive in, you absolutely can. But I'm just going to walk through a couple of these because we will see these again. So when we think about how we want to uh, apply comms in this space today, this is kind of what's recognized as the gold standard if we're doing all of these things. So let me walk through these. Um, positioning diverse voices as thought leaders. Obviously, being an expert or having innovative ideas isn't necessarily reserved for being the president or the CEO or being in the C-suite. The idea is that you wanna identify people in the organization with diverse perspectives and elevate them. 
Specifically for nonprofits, I think this is, next one is important. How can we ensure that the brand reflects the communities served? Does your nonprofit or a foundation take on a savior vibe or are they a partner? Are they a bridge? You want to present the organization as as a collaboration and not as a one-sided body that's coming in to save someone. Uh, and it's important to make the, the branding explicitly non-racist. It's not enough just to say, you know, we're helping all people. Yeah, these days you must be specific about what you're doing and how you're going to get there. In terms of writing an equity statement, this should be published on your website or, ex or circulated internally. But essentially, you want to you want to consult a variety of stakeholders and then say exactly why this is important to you, and then also give metrics for progress. It should also call out any systemic barriers to equity and how the organization is impacting them, or at least trying to address them. Style guides. Very crucial, creating style guides that have inclusive language. You wanna think about inclusivity and diversity in your language and your images. You wanna make sure that your language is ADA compliant, which a lot, of, a lot of organizations probably don't think about. Have you ever asked people to step up to the plate, step up to the cause? That's, that is not recognizing the, the ableness of everyone or, or differently abled. Um, so just little things like that, that we don't really think about can make a big difference. Also, you got to pay attention to the details and be consistent. Just even small things like capitalizing black, using Latinx versus Latino, all of those sorts of things, those make a massive difference because you're indicating someone's identity in that. And so you want to be very specific and intentional about those things. Similarly, we want to choose imagery and photos opportunities very wisely. Um, if you've hired a person of color to be the face of your organization, to consider exactly what that means and whether it was in good faith. Uh, similarly, if you have white staff members who are always scouting out people for photo ops and storytelling sound bites, that sort of thing, um, that is a dynamic that is, is not, very, um, not very helpful, I guess we should say. Uh, because white people shouldn't be the gatekeepers of what a story is. And so we need to, to be mindful of that. Uh, and then when we're organizing events, we don't want to use people as props. That is, that is tokenism. Just to, let's just stick the black guy in the photo. We'll look diverse. Not okay. We want, we want to avoid that. Uh, performative activism versus true advocacy. I think we all, if you're on social media at all, we've heard a lot about this in the past two years. Um, it is a good idea for organizations to elevate and amplify the voices of people of color as it relates to their organization and their mission. So they should absolutely do that. And knowing that social media campaigns are brief, that can often come off as very insincere. And so that kind of, of gesture also has to be paired with genuine activism. And you have to be very clear about what that genuine activism is. Reflecting diverse lived experiences and internal comms. As a former internal comms person, this one is near and dear to my heart because it is easy to zero in on a certain group of people within an organization and they're all, they're all you see and hear about. So it is important to make sure that you're um, including diverse voices in the stuff that you're sharing with employees. Even maybe going as far as enabling BIPOC to have dedicated space on your digital platforms internally to discuss issues that matter to them. Not unlike what we see with some affinity groups, time, same principle. We wanna make sure that the content is accessible to all. Um, eliminating jargon, a huge one. It happens all the time. Uh, you wanna think about your web in terms of, are people colorblind, deaf, dyslexic? All of those things. Do your fonts and your colors have a large contrast? All of those things 
go into accessibility. And you do want to steer clear again of ableist language, depressing, crazy, lame, that sort of stuff. It is alienating. And then you want to uh, mix up your communications and, and your mediums so you can meet people where they are in the languages they speak. If you're dealing with patients uh, and communities that speak a language other than English, you should be issuing your communications in English and whatever that is. Uh, so those are some of the, the kind of best case scenario practices. Few organizations meet the mark on all of these. This is an ideal state. It, but nonetheless, we need to we need to be aware of what that looks like. So communicators, speaking from experience, do not um, create in a vacuum. Often, even though we are often asked to, um, all of these best practices that we see actually require systems and structures to support their creation. We get those outputs without things being further upstream already in place. So. When you look at all of these, you can't have diverse voices as thought leaders if you don't have diverse people at all places in the organization. You can't write an equity state. If you don't have equity as an organizational priority. You can't have performative activism versus true advocacy if you can't actually be an advocate, if that is not made priority. You can't have imagery and photo opportunities that are inclusive if you don't have people making conscious choices in decision-making roles. All of these things, you see how there's there needs to be people, places, and things in place within an organization to even make these things happen. Yet, oftentimes communicators are asked just to go make these things. And that's how they come off as uh, inauthentic sometimes. So with that, this means that to execute DEI communications, it can't happen in a void. And so part of, of what we're gonna talk about today is what does it look like to have DEI integrated communication, not just DEI communication. We'll talk more about this in a minute, but first, because we need to go all the way back and see how the organization is set up, we need to look at, well, what exactly is the ideal environmental setup for an organization for DEI to thrive? We gotta take two steps back before we can even start talking comms. So what is that model environment? Let's talk about that. Thankfully, academic literature, sometimes never sees the light of day, is proving to be helpful in this instance. So I wanna pull up two theories that shed some light on how we have ideals for organizations that can really foster diversity, equity, and inclusion. So first one, the theory of generative interactions. This theory draws on sociology, communications, social psych, and organizational studies. And in short, what this theory means is that in order to facilitate inclusion, you have to overcome exclusionary dynamics. What is that? Self-segregation communication apprehension, stereotyping, stigmatizing. Uh, in order to overcome that, you have to create interactions, which is frequent quality, positive interactions that encourage adaptive cognitive processing, skill development and contact across difference. The researchers argue that organizational practices can create the right conditions for these. And then that creates and sustains all the associated benefits of having an organization committed to inclusion. But here's the catch. All of these organizational practices have to be done as a set. You can't pick and choose. They, they all work together as a system, so you gotta do them all. So what are these practices? Having a shared organizational purpose other than diversity, we can't just be bonding because we're all different. There has to be something about why the organization exists that we're all simultaneously pursuing. Um, for businesses, a lot of times that is the product or the service, but with nonprofits or other groups, you might need to get a little bit more specific about that. Um, for, um, for the second one, we're mixing diverse members repeatedly and frequently over protracted uh, periods of time. So long stretches. This is intentional community building. This is designing physical space a certain way. 
This is approaching virtual space a certain way. We're always mixing however we want to use that from a programmatic standpoint or from, um, you know, if we're in HR and we're trying to do succession planning or something like that, how does that look? We're always mixing people all the time. We're enabling different groups to have equal standing and insider status, which often doesn't happen in, in organizations that are hierarchical. And we want to provide collaborative independence. What is that? That's when you, ha you have a, a pair, y'all are interdependent on one another, but yet you still have individual uniqueness and a sense of belonging, together yet apart, collaborative independence. And then we also wanna have interpersonal comfort and self-efficacy or the idea that you are able to control your outcomes, have an impact on your life, that, that is self-efficacy. So the researchers argue that it's generative interactions at the interpersonal level, that's important, that are key to this type of inclusion because the boundaries of frequent, repeated, positive interactions all of those exclusionary dynamics are gonna stifle the vibe and they're gonna to totally shut it down. So if those boundaries are set at the organization level and they're permeating downward, right? It's part of the, it's par for the course, then you have a better chance of them being pervasive, holistic and consistent. That's how you generate benefit, right? So you have to have it at the organization level because if you just have it at the group or individual level, human nature takes over and our, our social psychological makeups take over and we self-segregate, we stigmatize, we stereotype and it kills it. So that's why it has to be permeating from the top down in this instance. So that's the theory of generative interactions. Hold on to that one. Two, let's turn to Tritton and Schoenberg's idea as diverse, of diversity as polyphony. Right, and you might know this term from me. Actually, in a polyphonic composition, voices are respected for their own timbre. They're not unified in a single voice, right? Like with a choir or something, but are instead temporarily in a dialogic way. So, organization polyphony looks like expansive spaces where uh, that different voices are allowed. Oh no. Can y'all still hear me? Be good. I, my internet's cracking up. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so, but this implies that multiple voices are dynamically combined rather than just merged, right? We're interacting, we're not just slammed together, which is a radical change from the more top down kind of communication you generally see in organizations. So, what does a polyphonic organization even look like in real life? What does that mean? So, organizational scholar Nicola Pless outline these, these things that you see on your screen. Um, and there's actually only four of them. <laughs> um, but uh, we gotta have mutual recognition of all participants in the dialogue. We gotta have long lasting relations that enable reciprocal trust. We have to have active encouragement of bringing diverse voices to the forefront. And we have to develop mutual understanding by directly addressing bias. So Tritton and Schoenborn, then if we look at the left side of the screen, then argue, okay, if we're actually going to have all of those things, then, and we're gonna take this approach to diversity, we have to do three things. We have to use um, recruitment and promotion to incorporate the goal of increased polyphony. We have to adjust our structures to accommodate it. And we have to nurture the exchange between organizational voices through our leadership, through our education and our organizational culture. So again, these are all, these are all things, it sounds great, right? We have to adjust some structures in order for that to happen. So those are, those are two theories that kind of show us, okay, you look at these terms, there's a lot of overlap kind of in what needs to happen to have the ideal environment for DE and I to thrive. But you might know, hmm, I haven't really been in too many organizations who have anything like that. In fact, it might be quite the opposite. And obviously the more that the environment embodies these characteristics that we just talked about, the easier it is to issue the communication that might support it. But even if you don't have this environment and you might say, look, I, I work in organizations where this ain't ever gonna happen. That's cool, all is not lost. 
we have fodder here through these, um, through these theories that can inform how we help create this environment through communications, DEI integrated communications to be specific. Just to be clear again, this approach that I'm about to explain does not advocate for DEI comms to be separate. Oftentimes in organizations, DNI comms are created in a separate group from corporate communications or the general communications. They're done by different people and they're never merged. They, they happen in parallel tracks. So that's not going to streamline the tenets that we talked about at the top of this because we can't do that in parallel tracks. When you integrate these ideas into all of your communications from the top downward, then you have a better chance of using communication uh, platforms and deliverables to actually create the environments we discussed. Even if there can't be some big systemic change, the way your communications are set up and the approach that you take can help to deliver that. Um, so what, if we have to have a different philosophical shift in order for this to happen, um, how do we initiate that? What exactly does that look like? If we're gonna say, okay, we don't have the organizational setup, but we can have the comm setup. How do we, how do we do that? So here's my own little philosophy and how we, how we change the game in terms of communications issued, especially at a corporate or not our top level for nonprofits, anything that might be hierarchical. We wanna look at three different points um, and how we can switch these up. So this is where the media psychology part starts to, to fold in to how we're doing this. So we want to recognize that today for most organizations, communications are objective statements of universal fact. It's an edict top-down kind of thing. We want to turn that on its head and we want to think of communications that are social constructions of culture and reality because everybody brings their whole self to communication, right? And so therefore they attach realities that are consonant with their own worldviews. So everybody's reading that memo differently. Organizations have to embrace the idea that while they might be under one clear mission, vision, sets of goals, all of that, there are multiple and individually held interpretations of all of those things. And everyone is experiencing them differently. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be so tightly managed. Secondly, we wanna flip from communications are repeated underscoring of one truth and universal direction, a one vision, one voice kind of vibe. We wanna turn that to communications are the conveyance of a collective vision held together by the sharing of multiple voices. So we still, got our, we still have our unifying vision, we still have our goals, but we know that multiple realities exist. People are taking all of this indifferently. And again, that's okay. Third, we want to take the idea that communications are creators and stewards of this homogenous culture under which we're all bonded and united think, you know, any kind of big organization that has almost a cult-like kind of following, it's like that, right? We want to flip that to that the communications reinforce a collectivistic culture where difference and shared values can coexist. So there, that makes room for difference rather than you must drink the Kool-Aid, right? Um, and we know that perhaps not all leaders are going to be in line with that because that means letting go of a lot of authority. Um, so this is a this is a pie in the sky kind of setup. I understand that, but you can make some subtle changes to start to embrace this, even if it's not held wholesale. So um, I think that if you do make this shift, or at least parts of it, and you can do that without kind of this wholesale buy-in, um, you can create communications and platforms that further enable all of these tenets that we just heard with the, with the theory of generative interactions and polyphony, we can make those happen. So say that we, we get to do this. They're like, okay, here's you. I like your little philosophy. Go and try to implement that. What does that look like if we're using both that philosophy and tenets of media psychology? to start creating things. What we do is we lean into making through story and through voice. And I'm gonna go through each of these. So 
why story? What, why is that important? Well, we've got a lot from the literature to support why that would be important. So narrative messaging stories tend to activate bottom-up inductive type processing. So some of the more recent research is showing that narrative tends to be more persuasive than what they call expository messages, the stuff that only contains statistical info, descriptive info, the, the kind of bland stuff. So stories are more persuasive. And research shows that they tend to be easier to remember since they tend to make use of imagery and contain information about events and characters that are linked with one another. So those vivid images have the potential to evoke kind of a lifelike and emotional sense and therefore have impactful experiences among the reader, viewer, listener, whatever, whatever the audience is. Scholars have argued that deep and sustainable organizational change is actually unlikely to happen solely through logic and logical argumentation. If it's devoid of any emotional influence, it ain't gonna stick. So those narratives that provide a more distinct storyline can actually be more effective in enacting change. When we process a story, our brains tend to kick into a gear where we're constructing our little mental models to identify elements of the story and see where we line up with it, which creates a really intense emotional focus. If you've ever watched a movie that you were really into, you know this, this vibe, this place, right? And so actually there's a name for this in the media literature, it's called transportation theory. Um, and its creators, Green and Brock, say that we're, when we're in this state of transportation, which is a state of flow, by the way, um, the ability to engage in counter arguments is greatly reduced. So compared to people hearing the expository message, just the data, just the facts, right? Individuals viewing a narrative message are less likely to engage in that critical judgment and just accept it as is. So when we're thinking, okay, we want people to understand others' lived experience, well, the data is not gonna convey that. The story has a much better shot of doing that. So we want stories because they can drive that engagement, because they can drive that acceptance, but we also find that in the research that it can also lead to opinion change, which is always a great thing uh, doing this work, regardless of the medium in which it's presented. So it could be a, a memo, a video, a blog post, a tweet, any of those things. Uh, it can still have the power to shift uh, opinions. So, you know, when we think about all of the tenets of DEI, that story is integral to create the engagement and to carry the meaning and to potentially change the belief. So, and it could be another way to deliver generative interactions that we talked about earlier. This, especially in digital means, how can we use story to create those positive frequent interactions? This is a way. If I'm watching a story uh, on, on my intranet about one of my coworkers, I might form a bond with them without ever meeting them because we have some shared experience. Who knows? But we know that story does what data and stats can't do alone. So that's why we want to embrace that. So that's story. So voice. Why do we want to do this? What exactly does that even mean? So we want to embrace this because of its ability to drive meaning and identity. Two researchers, Hull and Greeno, they describe the development of voice as the ways in which an individual presents and represents themselves to others and to themselves, thereby authoring and co-authoring their identities in the social worlds in which they participate. So long story short, it's how they define themselves and how they show up. But to be able to share your voice, particularly in a space that honors it and welcomes it, can positively affect identity development and increases that self-efficacy part that we talked about earlier. The ability to say, I can do this, I can show up, I have the ability to impact my life. Um, yes, scholars argue that actually it's more than just being able to develop individually, that voice can also influence shared meaning. So a Russian philosopher from long time ago, Mikhail Bakhtin, he created this theory called dialogism, which essentially means 
that living is participating in dialogue. I love that. Um, Bob Teen once stated, my voice can mean, but only with others. At times in chorus, but at the best of times in dialogue. So in his view, dialogism or what the meeting of multiple voices is a necessary driver for meaning and a necessary driver for human perception and even existence. To hear somebody's voice show up is a way to convey shared meaning. Within the organizational and human resource literature, you often hear about employee voice. Um, this used to mean um, like, you know, how people engage to help decision-making or how they're griping about something, but now it's widely considered to be how, um, how people have an opportunity to have a say. Um, and so while it's difficult to assert like direct links between having a voice and organizational outcomes, there is some research that show that Looks like Angela might be frozen for a moment. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it looks like I'm going to pause recording, recording real quick. Okay, guys, thanks for hanging out for a second while I got back in. So we'll just pick up where we left off. So let's talk a little bit about what this looks like in practice. We're gonna talk a little bit about leaders uh, and one theory from the literature that can uh, help us. And then we're gonna talk about some ideas that I came up with on my own that embody story and voice. Um, so first, let's talk about leaders uh, because often communicators are called in to help leaders communicate in contention um, when there are Opposite, opposite factions, if you will. Um, sometimes they're warring factions. Um, and so we are called to come in and try to help create communications for whatever is going on. Um, for this particular um, for this particular article, uh, John leans on narrative, extended narrative empathy, which is actually um, from uh, the researcher Claire. And Claire describes extended narrative empathy as life as a living body of stories that compose self and other. Uh, through gathering multiple narratives and through doing what they call reflexive reading, listening, interpretation, empathy comes out of that because we get other people's stories and we, we evaluate them with an open mind, somewhat critically, but not necessarily in a judgment way, right? We're just, we're just really leaning into them. Uh, this allows for multiple viewpoints, and then those individual stories are woven together to a, have a collective narrative of the other. So John says that we can activate this approach by embracing three steps. We can first proactively collect multiple narratives, including the counter narratives, which is probably the most important part. We want to build empathy towards those that are in opposition to us. So how can we do that? And first, we got to understand their story. Then we achieve understanding through the empathic reading of the narratives. Specifically, this researcher argues through what they call protagonist inversion. And what that means is that you put on the hat of the person that you're, that you're disagreeing with. And what, then you get a sense of what their world is like. This helps you uh, understand the cause and the effects and the moral endpoints in their storylines. And then you can identify the points of both contention and connection, which is incredibly important in creating the narrative for this last step where we're allowing everyone to see their roles and values represented in the narrative. The kicker here is that this can't happen with just a couple of people, right? This has to happen 
um, with diverse voices adding to the narrative, right? So then when you invite diverse voices to come in and actually be part of the narrative making, leadership becomes shared. It's not the top down thing. We're inviting people to sit at the table and we're creating things uh, together. So you think, okay, well, when, when do you actually use this? <laughs> so usually this type of approach was used when uh, unionization um, comes up and they're trying to work a deal out with the unions. This is when this is particularly effective, but it can work with anything where there might be opposing factions. So even to think through like mergers and acquisitions or anything like that, where somebody's coming in to do something different to the other, even this can, can work in those situations. It allows the leader to A, share the table and B, craft a narrative that includes everyone, not just the top down, this is what's happening, right? And this, and you will take it. Uh, you should see yourself in this where we're building stories that help have empathy for the other. So that's one. Let's go into some more brass tacks. When we think about DEI integrated deliverables, let's go back to our best practices that we talked about at the top of this. So we're positioning diverse voices as thought leaders. Well, what exactly does that look like in practicality? Well, that can mean a lunch and learn series about different aspects of the business. Because again, we're not uniting under our shared purpose of we're all different. It ain't about diversity. We're committing to serving the business or serving the nonprofit, serving the organization. It could be something like future casting. We're bringing in people from diverse parts of the organization, from diverse perspectives to think about what's next for the business, what's next for the organization. That's one example. To ensure that the brand reflects the community served, um, what if you had an annual report that was not just this kind of laundry list of all the things that happened that year, but were instead presented as a narrative from the stories that the of the people served? So instead, if I have a nonprofit, instead of just reporting out all the great things you did for the community that year, I'm tapping five to seven people that we served. And I'm telling, or I'm allowing them to tell their stories. I don't wanna be the mediator of that story. I'm telling stories in their voice that actually convey the work that we did that year. Will it still have data and stats and all the things that annual reports have? Absolutely. But instead of it being a narrative presented from the organization, it is narrated by the people that the organization serves. Do you see the difference? We're, we're, we're Lay, we're evening the playing field, so to speak, so that the, the storyline comes from the people served or the people within the business or the customer, rather than the organization dictating exactly what that story is. So that's, that's one idea. When we're talking about writing statement, what if it wasn't written at all? What if it was a video where the individual members of the organization are reciting parts of the statement and it's all edited together? Maybe it never lives in print. Maybe it's a visual dynamic where you see the faces and the voices and you see the dynamism of what that organization is attempting to bring to the table via equity. So that's one idea. With performative activism versus true advocacy, you can invite customers, partners, and clients to tell their stories digitally and in person. We see this on social media all the time. This is not new. Um, but just think about, it'll depend on the organization, how best to bring that to life and how to do something novel in that space. They have media all the time. That's an easy way to do it. But perhaps there's another way that is more specific to your organization, make more sense. And then reflecting. Is what most organizational values and tenets are, honesty, integrity, resilience, all the buzzwords, um, all of that sort of stuff. Um, there's Those stories come from real life. I have a story of resilience. You have a story of resilience. You have a story of honesty or how come we can't position the organization through actual personal story? They might not even have anything to do with work. So, those are, that's kind of on its head from a media psych perspective. So that's it. That's my story. 
Um, love to hear from you. If you have questions, if you just have thoughts, if there's something that resonates with you, um, let me know. And I, we're a small enough group, you can probably just, un if you like, And I'm looking here at the chat. If you'd rather type it in, if you have a question or a comment, I can read it. I was just saying in the chat that um, this was excellent, uh, especially because I'm a change management type consultant most of the time, oh, that's the hat yeah. I wear. So often, well, I mean, always part of change management is communications and absolutely and you know and a lot of times you can be a change management expert of one sort or another but really struggle with the communications because you're not a communications expert so I've always advocated to bring someone in who's much more savvy with communications and uh, when we get to that spot um, in the change management or the you know the plan ahead, the roadmap. And uh, so this has been great. It really brings the theory forward. I'm gonna definitely do some more reading on the transportation theory. And uh, no, it's just, it's been yes. excellent because it's given me some language, some ideas, some tangible ideas and the theory behind so much of the communication pieces that um, that I think about when I'm putting a change plan together. Absolutely. So, you know, transportation theory comes in very handy when you're building campaigns because we have we have examples of transportation theory all the time. Harry Potter is an excellent one. Marvel movies. For some people Ted Lasso. Like any any of these things, right? Right? Any anything where they the storyline has gripped people and they're telling people about it at work or on social or at home, you're seeing transportation theory at work there. And so how can you take a story and create and embed elements in it that it creates that response? That's essentially what transportation theory helps you do. And that's easier said than done, especially depending on if you're working on certain change management, uh, some of those can be real downers. <laughs> and it's hard, you know, it, that, those are changes that are not going to be well received. And so what do you do with that? Um, there are ways to absolutely pull out universals. This is, if I have something negative, this is where I always go if I'm planning a campaign. What is the shared experience that we're gonna have no matter what? Mm -hmm. How can I double down on that and, and build stories around that? Sometimes is the fact that, yeah, we're now going to be merged as one organization. That's not always this really strong selling point if you didn't like the organization <laughs> to begin yeah. with. Um, if you're thinking in terms of a merger acquisition, but you know, um, that getting trying to get down to core wants and needs is always, it, it's a safe space. You can always uh, come out with something good there, even if the, the message that you're delivering is not going to be well received. I think one of the challenges is that you never have. Well, I mean, you're never going to have everybody okay with the change or whatever, but you're, I always find that there's this whole big group of people who are so on board and they're ready to jump forward today. And then there's a group who are just, they don't want this for whatever reason, or they just are, they just don't like change to begin with. And so your yes. message is actually two different messages, but it has to be delivered in one package. So it I has think to be delivered in one package. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But going back to the narrative empathy part, why don't they like the change? Yeah. It could, it could be something as simple. I don't want to relocate to where you're moving the headquarters. Don't want to do it. Yeah. Okay, let's dig a little deeper. I don't want my, have to lift my kids out of school. They're about to graduate. And now you're making me choose between my family and my job. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. Even just acknowledging that hardship can go a long way, even though it ain't gonna change, but you're still moving to Dallas, you know, you still up to whether you wanna come or not. Um, that at least that acknowledgement of a, of a human conundrum can yeah. go a long way. That's great, thanks. 
Any other? I, I was, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. No, I I was drawn to the trans uh, of the transportation theory because yes. I'm a former railroader. I worked for the railroad for ten years. I yes. went through the um, uh, the merger of a uh, chassis system with Seaboard that's now CSX. Okay, and I had okay. to make a choice. Yeah, my job went to Jacksonville. Okay, and. My family was here. I'm an only child. My mom watched my children and she was the only one who was gone. And so yeah. I made the choice to leave, you know, to take the buyout, yes. um, to leave the railroad. And so I understand the importance of communication because I was not shocked by that merger mm -hmm. and all of it going to Jacksonville because Jacksonville had the technology. Correct. And I went inside of the railroad. I was that technology person. I was the one who took all of the rates and put them into technology. And when I saw the railroad um, seaboard actually could watch a train move from Canada to mm -hmm. Florida, I knew where we were headed. So I was not surprised. There were so many people who cried. So many people who cried. Absolutely. It existed that change. But it was a change for a better, and I could see that. And so it wasn't any um, telling me or communicating to me that this was a good move. I understood that. My husband retired from the railroad. He didn't have to leave because he was on the road. Right. And, um, so I understood that. But I remember um, coworkers very upset. Yes. They were crying. Mm -hmm. Some did go to Jacksonville with the job. Yeah. Um, but I remember that feeling of I'm okay because I had skills and I yes. could work anywhere. But yes. that was the importance of, of, of understanding, uh, understanding the corporation and understanding it from the corporate perspective. And so I did understand what they were doing and why. Um, however, we were the larger railroad. And so therefore everybody just knew internally everything was coming to Baltimore and yep. it didn't. It didn't. Yep. And so I do think communication, how an organization communicates. And I happen to be teaching trans, um, transformational leadership. Oh, yeah. So okay. I, I yeah. talk about, you know, communicating with your team. Yes. And how important that is. But it first begins with developing a relationship with them. Even Absolutely. though what's coming down from the top to the bottom, uh -huh. you have this space right here. And it's you that the team is following. That the Absolutely. Team will listen to. And so I am going to explore transformational theory because it is telling a story. And I talk about them telling a story. <laughs> you know, your story Absolutely. matters and how that, that matches up with your team in order to get them on board. And of course, you're not going to get everyone on board. Nope. But you have to acknowledge their pain. Absolutely. And understand that. So um, yep. I think that's going to be very interesting. Might be another paper I write. <laughs> I, I dig it because I mean, there's a lot that you can do in transformational leadership with this sort of communication approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in what you were describing, let's take the, the team, right? Mm -hmm. If you do narrative empathy, right? I, I, as a team lead, I know that not everybody's on the same page, right? Right. So I'm understanding all the different narratives including the ones that are opposite of mine mm -hmm. and talking to the team as a group, I'm saying, look, I know you don't want to leave your families. I know we've created our own little family here and now mm -hmm. that's going to be broken up. Mm -hmm. I know that your identity is tied to your job and that's important to you. And that's how you show up in the world. And I'm going to hold space for you while we all figure out what we're going to do with this take the buyout if you're going to move to jack if you're going to stay in baltimore whatever whatever the thing is mm -hmm. right some some frontline managers are often the best in terms of holding this kind of space for this kind of communication i agree with that i agree with that absolutely yeah 
Mm -hmm. They're the closest to the individual contributor a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they hold a lot of power and oftentimes they get the short end of the stick. Right. When if we just gave them some resource to be able to communicate, they, nat they naturally do it anyway because they have to build the team. Right. So, right. Uh, you know, but yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. If you're yeah. interested, you know where to find me. APAN, building body to you if there's any way I can help you. Okay, I, I will be looking you up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to share before we adjourn? Well, I'm grateful for all of you for hanging in there and um, hanging out while I had to come in and come back. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, again, any of you are always welcome to contact me. I'm at, at a Patterson at fielding.edu. Please look me up. I'm at Dr. Angela Patterson on Instagram, which is where I spend most of my social time. Um, so I'd love to, to work and connect with any of you, um, especially around these topics that we covered today. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Angela, thank you. That was just phenomenal. I felt like we could go for hours. <laughs> or have There's like a lot here. We, we could, we could have an entire course on this. <laughs> uh, thank you. There are entire courses on it, yes. <laughs> from you, from you. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> from you, yes. <laughs> thank you everyone so much for being here today. It was truly, truly a pleasure having you join. And again, to view this fantastic content again, if you're on the homepage at the conference website, you're in the attendee hub to see this. Click on sessions and then click on on demand and this should be available in about an hour. Great, awesome. Thank you again. Thank All you right, guys. Bye everyone. Bye.